people joining in this uh, YouTube channel to revise the urology curriculum for FRCS exam preparation. Thank you for the trainee who has agreed to record this session so that it will be a good learning and revision tool. Your time starts now. Yeah. Today we are going to discuss the scenarios in BPH and if term permits functional urology. You have a 68 year old gentleman presenting to a &E with a distended bladder up to umbilicus. How are you going to evaluate him? I will review this patient uh, myself in the emergency department. I will make sure that he is resuscitated <coughs> and he is hemodynamically stable. I make sure that um, he, is, he was given some uh, uh, pain relief uh, to control the uh, pain if he's in pain. Um, I will examine the I will take a focus history with, uh, from the patient. Uh, I will do an um, uh, examination the presence of chaperone and the range uh, for some uh, tests. Um, so I will take a history from the patient uh, briefly uh, to know uh, whether he has any uh, Lorient tract symptoms previously, the duration, uh, severity, whether it is mainly storage or uh, avoiding uh, symptoms any incontinence associated with that, any bedwetting. I will ask about any uh, red flag symptoms like uh, hematuria, uh, weight loss, bone pain. Um, uh, I will ask about also <coughs> his baseline sexual function, any constipation. I will check his past medical history and uh, medication, especially diabetes or any neurological disease. I will also check any history of surgery or radiotherapy. I will check his uh, drinking habit, smoking, um, and uh, then I will proceed to a rapid examination, uh, mainly examining the abdomen, looking for any uh, palpable mass or tenderness in the loin. I will check the uh, palpable bladder, which is uh, up to the umbilicus, according to the uh, ED doctor. Uh, I will check the uh, external genitalia, mainly looking for any possibility of meatal stenosis, uh, pyrosis, uh, pulpal nodule in the urethra, which such is suggestive of urethra stricture. And I will perform, uh, with the patient consent in the presence of chaperon, I will perform a digital rectal um, examination, looking for any lower limb edema as well. And um, I will do a focus neurological examination if there are suggestive symptoms. Um, um, I expect that the ED doctors have already inserted the urethral catheter for the patient. If it is not done, then I will insert a catheter for the patient to relieve his uh, retention, and then I can arrange for a further test. Okay. This patient is asymptomatic, and uh, he just presented to a &E because of the tiredness and fatigue, and the relatives brought him to the hospital. He has no specific past medical comorbidities and uh, he's otherwise quite comfortable he has no pain he was catheterized as you said <coughs> and uh, he drained 1.3 liters of clear urine you said you will concentrate on medications what medications may lead to this situation um sometime anticholinergic medication uh, may precede acute urinary uh, retention uh, in the patient um, and this could be in the form of um, um, anti Parkinson medication, sometimes antihistamine. All of these they contain anticholinergic uh, component, which may cause um, uh, constipation in this patient. Uh, sorry, which may cause retention in this patient. Okay, so how are you going to evaluate this patient further? So, um, since the patient uh, had a retention of uh, more than a, a liter, I want to uh, send the urine for um, uh, urine dipstick and also to check if there is any sugar protein and the specific gravity i want also to do a blood test to check the kidney uh, function and uh, i will counsel the patient about having a psa uh, test as well i'm aware of the controversy about doing psa in the acute uh, stage but um, i will have just an idea about the psa whether it is in hundreds or it is just mildly elevated due to the retention and catheterization and uh, since he uh, um, was uh, having a retention with more than a liter, I will arrange for ultrasound uh, of the kidney. I will observe his urine output to see how much he is draining per hour. Um, and then I will take it from there. <coughs> okay, his blood investigation shows kidney function is normal. Urine infection, in, uh, urine investigation dipstick taken when he was catheterized showed say 1 plus leukocyte, 1 plus RBCs and um, ultrasound showed upper tracts normal 
and bladder is empty with catheter is in place what are you going to do so my suspicion is that uh, this patient is uh, uh, a low pressure chronic urinary retention um, i will have a look i will check his uh, blood pressure in the lying and standing position and i will check his urine output for the uh, next two to three hours and if he is not a drain significant amount there is no uh, possible suspected diuresis uh, then uh, patient uh, can be uh, discharged home and then i will arrange uh, to see him in the clinic and in uh, four to uh, sorry i will um uh i want to, i will discharge him with the catheter initially and uh, my plan is further assessment and discussion about the long-term management and this will be done in the clinic uh, in four weeks time okay you said measuring blood pressure in lying down and standing positions what is the importance of it uh, because uh, if there is a difference of more than a 20 uh, millimeter mercury between the lying and the standing indicated that the patient has uh, some uh, uh, volume loss and uh, he need a fluid replacement and he's at risk of uh, having a post obstructive diuresis is it common in low pressure chronic retention it's not common no usually it will it, this will happen in the high pressure chronic urinary retention Okay, what is the pathophysiology behind uh, low pressure chronic retention? The pathophysiology is uh, chronic gradual distension uh, of the bladder muscle by an increasing amount of residual urine, uh, which will cause um, um, secondary changes in the bladder muscle, including um, collagen uh, deposition and uh, fibrosis, changes in the musculature of the uh, a bladder leading at the end into end stage uh, um, uh, failure of the detrusal muscle with painless chronic urinary retention. Okay, so you have sending the patient with a catheter. How are you going to review him? So I will let, I make sure that the patient uh, know how to take care of the catheter, and then I will bring him back to the clinic in four weeks uh, according to the um, uh, capacity. And then I will discuss with the patient uh, about the long-term uh, treatment. I will inform the patient that um, uh, my suspicion is that he has a, a weak bladder muscle. Therefore, the tension will happen. We are not sure whether this accompanied by uh, bladder outlet obstruction or not. Um, so I will arrange for this patient to have a, a urod <coughs> so to have a urodynamic study for better counseling about uh, uh, benefit from uh, surgical, <coughs> sorry, surgical treatment of the prostate. Um, you said uh, it is due to decompensated detrusor muscle and uh, other than bladder outlet obstruction, what may be the reason? Uh, it could be due to uh, the torsal muscle weakness, due to neurological disease, which happened in patient, diabetic patient with peripheral neuropathy, patient with a previous uh, uh, pelvic surgery, previous radiotherapy, fracture pelvis. All these may lead to um, a form of lower motor neuron um, um, bladder dysfunction. Okay, what are you expecting to see in urodynamics? So in neurodynamic, uh, I want to see in the filling phase the sensation of the patient and also to see the uh, systematic capacity. And then uh, during uh, voiding, my aim is to see uh, the voiding pressure. And we have a limit of 35 centimeter water if the patient is having a voiding detrusal pressure of 35 centimeter uh, water or above. It means that he still have uh, acceptable muscle function and uh, he will benefit uh, from the um, surgery and also i will look if there is any evidence of bladder outlet obstruction uh, in the urodynamic okay what is the main difference between high pressure chronic retention and low pressure chronic retention in urodynamics um, the main the main difference uh, i think that it, uh, in the urodynamic it, the high pressure may be associated with some detrusal overactivity uh, with reduced compliance, uh, high intravascular pressure during filling, and it will be associated with uh, high voiding pressure uh, with low flow. Okay. Um, okay, urodynamic shows that uh, the bladder contractility is low, uh, otherwise um, patient is able to void on command. <coughs> His bladder capacity is huge, as I said, 1.3 liters. 
So how are you going to manage him further? Um, sorry, uh, what about the 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 trusal, uh, uh, contraction? Say 40, 40 mm G. 40, sorry. Yeah, so I would take this as acceptable, uh, the trusal muscle. And so I will counsel the patient uh, about uh, the um, process surgery, uh, which may help him to be uh, catheter free. However, I can't guarantee uh, a complete bladder emptying after the surgery, and he may need to use self intermittent catheterization to facilitate complete bladder emptying. Okay, we'll stop there. It's 10 minutes here. Um, good, perfor good performance. There is no major concerns. Your opening gambit is fine. You are trying to cover the maximum points which examiner may be expecting. Uh, my only advice is. Um, try to stick to the specific scenario that specific gentleman presenting with uh, distended bladder up to umbilicus painless rather than trying to discuss the general low pressure chronic retention so if you think in that aspect you will bring the medications like uh, is there any other medications other than what you said like antipsychotics or sympathomimetic drugs you will bring a much more number of medications while initially the medications which you brought in were more of like an anti-diabetic or few things only and then on questioning you are able to bring much more medications like anticholinergic and other things but still you missed antipsychotics, sympathomimetic drugs so the medication history is very very important in this scenario so try to bring it to that scenario I agree with you that uh, doing a PSA is predominantly to see if the PSA is like in hundreds which will give you a suspicion of possible prostate cancer but that indirectly prostate examination also will help you a lot if it's really 100 means your DRE will show something. It is always preferable not to bring PSA measurement in a patient who is having catheterization. I completely accept your point but in the exam sometimes the examiner may misunderstand that okay in spite of catheterization this candidate wants to do a PSA test. The easiest yeah. and safest answer is uh, I will not do PSA in this context at this time since patient had retention and also catheter in place but in due course I will keep PSA in my follow-up. Digital examination I will try to rule out the prostate cancer that is the gold standard answer. Otherwise if you want to substantiate you want to do PSA because you want to rule out something like more than 100 PSA which will affect your treatment you need to be very careful and you need to substantiate it you are moving from a gold standard performance to a good performance sometimes it's good examiners may ac accept it but why do you take any risk isn't it okay yeah let's get a risk Thank yeah and um, as you see I started the discussion as a gentleman presenting with a uh, bladder distension up to umbilicus and also pain free. So take the clues and try to stick to the low pressure chronic retention because you are slightly going into the general discussion of uh, post obstructive diuresis, monitoring urine output, uh, monitoring blood pressure, standing and sitting position, nothing wrong in it. But the examiner should not think he is on and off bringing in all the features of high pressure chronic retention into the discussion so they should not uh, create a doubt so try to make sure you are discussing only the scenario uh, if you are very particular you can say I know even though the changes of blood pressure during position or post restrictive diuresis is not physiologically possible in a low pressure chronic retention I wish to observe the patient that is fine okay uh, yeah. Uh, at one point you are discussing a lot of things of HPCR in the discussion yeah. and um, then the commonest reason is bladder outlet obstruction. Um, you are discussing slightly like it could be a primary bladder dysfunction or rarely could be due to bladder outlet obstruction. It is bladder outlet obstruction unless otherwise proven and uh, so take bladder outlet obstruction as the first reason and other things like neurology, post-surgery and all is very less chances. The main difference in urodynamics between the high pressure chronic retention and low pressure chronic retention is end micturation pressure. End micturation pressure is high in high pressure chronic retention that is the reason why the reflux happens. As the reflux is happening it results in increased <coughs> renal pressure resulting in renal failure 
and uh, that's what resulting in fluid overload and that's the reason for post substructive diuresis once the patient is got catheterized so otherwise your other urodynamic features were quite okay yeah can, can i ask about the, the high pressure chronic irritation because there is a, this uh, loop diagram for the pressure in the high pressure chronic irritation but my understanding is that the highest point of pressure is at the end of the filling is it at the end of the filling or at the end of voiding? End of filling, normally men have good high pressure. That's what makes the patient to go to the toilet. Uh, anyone, normal people I mean. So once the pressure is there, once the patient is started voiding, the pressure should decrease. And uh, the pressure will increase to empty the bladder because we are squeezing the detrusor but the patient should not go above the competence of the vesicoureteric junction. Once that uh, competence is breached, then only the reflex happens. So yeah. normally what happens is at the end of micturation, the pressure should come down so that even if there is some urine reflexing back, it should come back to the bladder. In mm. high pressure chronic attention during end of micturation, the pressure is high so the urine stays in the ureter because urine stays in the ureter urine stays in the pelvis resulting in hydroureteronephrosis that results in increased retinal pressure decreased excretion renal failure fluid overload there is a good bmj article um, on just chronic urinary retention you can search for it and mm -hmm. also there is a nice guidelines document you can search for it in bnf.nice.org not the nice website it's a bnf.nice.org website very mm. simple document uh, you have covered most of it but it clearly says the end micturation pressure is the main difference between high pressure chronic attention and low pressure chronic attention okay. normally in the voiding always the pressure will go up then only you will create a good stream that's a physiologically normal but even after completing the micturation, if the pressure stays high, that results in reflex and high pressure chronic retention. Yeah. Okay. And, and my, my understanding is that since it is not a high pressure, then uh, we cannot walk the patient. Um, and maybe we, I don't think there's any benefit from time to loosen, but at least we cannot walk him while he's waiting for the surgery. We can teach him self intermittent catheterization. Yes. So, treatment of low pressure chronic tension is different from high pressure chronic tension. In high pressure chronic tension, we can't walk. The patient will be on continuous draining bladder catheter. If the patient is so excellent and mentally very good in understanding, he can try intermittent catheterization if he doesn't like continuous bladder drainage. But end of the day, patient will be listed for surgery in six weeks to eight weeks in high pressure chronic tension. In low pressure chronic tension, it depends upon the post void residue. If the post void residue is less than 500 ml, patient doesn't really require a definitive surgery. Patient can be started on alpha blockers, by alpha reductase inhibitors based upon the prostate size, the same principles of LUTS treatment, and patient can be monitored. Alpha mm -hmm. blockers will help in improving the urine outflow. Intermittent catheterization is also equally good. We can talk the patient. If okay. the patient's post void residue is more than 500 ml, patient needs long term follow up and uh, observation to make sure they are not ending up in another episode of low pressure chronic tension or high pressure chronic tension later. Usually, it's very rare for those people to end up in high pressure chronic tension. Okay. If the patient doesn't like cathe intermittent catheterization, there is an out reason for bladder outlet obstruction surgery but in low pressure chronic attention since the bladder detrusor is already decompensated there is no assurance that bladder outlet surgeries like whether it's a TURP or holmium enucleation of the prostate or any anatomical enucleation of the prostate will result in a good detrusor recovery and normal voiding so bladder recovery only the time will say while in high pressure chronic tension, TURP or a good anatomical enucleation of prostate will give very good result. We know the detrusor is working. Because of the detrusor is working only in the end micturation, the pressure is maintained high resulting in high pressure chronic tension. 
So in high pressure contention, in fact, you don't have to even do urodynamics. The presentation of hydronephrosis, renal failure itself is a sign of good detrusor function and they will come out very good with surgery. While in low pressure chronic tension, we need to do urodynamics to make sure that the detrusor pressures are nicely documented. We should warn the patient about the hypocontractile detrusor, which is not recovering in the future follow-up and need for intermittent self catheterization or if the patient toxicity is not allowing a continuous bladder drainage in spite of surgery. So we need to warn the patient. That's the main crux difference between low pressure and high pressure chronic tensions. Thank you very much. Okay. Can we go for another scenario? Yes, please. Okay. And uh, in these scenarios of retention, do not bring in any fancy newer modalities like Eurolift, Resume, ITIN, Aquablation. Number one, they were not tested in this situation. Even though we have papers to support Eurolift as a role in chronic urinary retention or mm -hmm. acute urinary retention predominantly, we know the multicenter UK based study. The patients selected were very close to group with a post war density less than 500 ml. So it's very difficult to bring uh, out of a blue moon one study and substantiate your finding. It's always better to go for gold standard TURP or anatomical enucleation of the prostate using any energy, whether it's bipolar, thulium laser, or holmium laser, doesn't matter. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so we'll go to the second scenario today. Time starts now. You have a 80 year old man presenting with a high PSA of 28 and uh, he's attending the clinic. He has significant symptoms of uh, not able to empty the bladder comfortably, weak stream and also urgency associated with nocturnal frequency. How are you going to evaluate him? So I would see this patient as a matter of urgency since his PSA is high. I, um, I, I will see him accompanied by the um, oncology specialist nurse. I will <coughs> take a history, focus examination in the presence of chaperone with the patient concerned uh, and arrange some investigation. I'll ask about his uh, avoiding symptoms or whether it's mainly predominant storage or avoiding and um, about um, uh, associated incontinence with that and use of uh, pads about the uh, frequency and severity of the bed uh, wetting, um, any red flag symptoms like hematuria, weight loss, bone pain, neurological symptoms, um, any constipation. Uh, I will ask also about his uh, medical um, uh, medical history, any uh, comorbidities, the use of uh, any medication, uh, including phytotherapy. I will ask about any previous surgery or radiotherapy, uh, uh, about his social life, whether he's independent or living with someone else. And uh, I will uh, do a focused uh, examination in the presence of chaperone with the patient consent, uh, examine um, mainly looking for any, uh, um, I will examine the patient uh, generally looking for any uh, wasting uh, cachexia, I will look also for any uh, palpable uh, bladder. I will examine the genitalia and then examine the rectal examination. Uh, and uh, I will assess uh, him neurologically if there are suggestive symptoms. I will do urine dip stick. Um, uh, I will arrange for the patient. I will ask the patient to fill the IPSS uh, form and uh, three day bladder diary. And I will do flow rate uh, bladder scan and I will counsel him uh, about uh, the significance of his uh, IPSA. Okay. Uh, his examination shows a possible nodule on the right side of the prostate with clinical stage T to A. His urophrometry showed obstructive pattern with maximum flow of only 8 ml per second. He voided 300 ml with uh, 200 ml residue. What further things you want to do? So for... Um I will divide into management of his PSA and the management of his uh, LUTs for the uh, PSA. Uh, I will check his uh, overall uh, fitness and other comorbidities. And if the patient is uh, uh, fit with no major comorbidities, then I will arrange uh, for him uh, to have a, a bone scan and MRI scan and take it further from there. 
for the lower urinary tract symptoms. Uh, he is, uh, uh, sorry, what, what was his IPSS? His IPSS is 30 out of 35, QOL 5 out of 6. So this patient is having a quite significant lower urinary tract symptoms with a quite uh, low uh, flow rate and significant post void uh, residue. So uh, I will start by giving him lifestyle advice uh, and then I will um, advise him to start uh, uh, Tamsulucin uh, 400 microgram uh, once daily and I will explain to the patient uh, the mechanism of action and the possible side effect. Okay. Um, you are starting him on Tamsulosin and uh, so regarding the PSA, you have arranged bone scan and MRI scan. Bone scan was normal. MRI scan showed pyrad 3 lesions in the right lobe. Otherwise, transition zone and left lobes were normal. Yeah, so I explained to the patient that uh, pyrad 3 is in the gray uh, area and uh, in my practice here, we offer the patient uh, prostate biopsy for uh, PRAD3, even if there is no um, obvious uh, targetable lesion, we will do a systemic TP biopsies. Okay, you're doing the biopsy, which showed uh, right side uh, four out of six scores positive with Gleason score four plus three. And on the left side, none of the cores were positive. Okay, so this patient, uh, I will discuss uh, the histology um, and his uh, MRI and bone scan in our MDT meeting. And most likely this patient is having an intermediate risk uh, prostate cancer. Sorry, that's a high risk of prostate cancer since his PSA is more than uh, a 20 with a Gleason 3 plus 4, 7. So um, uh, this patient uh, uh, will be offered uh, a treatment and I think uh, this treatment will be to give him um, a new adjuvant hormonal therapy and then radical radiotherapy. Is there any role for CT scan? Um, no, not, not, not routinely we perform the CT scan. It's mainly the concern of the oncologist about the extent of the lymph nodes. So if the initial MRI showed you no know, significant pelvic lymph node, then unlikely that there will be a, a uh, extra pelvic lymph node. Um, so if the oncologist is happy with the uh, uh, finding from the MRI and the bone scan, we don't arrange a, a CT scan uh, regularly. Okay. Let us assume this patient has no metastasis, organ confined, Gleason 4 plus 3 prostate cancer, and um, you are giving him the options. You said radical prostatectomy. Any other options possible for him? Um, so, sorry, radical radical radiotherapy. I said uh, not a prostatectomy. Okay, why you are selecting radical radiotherapy? Why not prostatectomy? Uh, usually, we we don't offer radical prostatectomy for patient uh, after the age of seventy five in in my practice because of the associated uh, uh, risk of anesthesia and, and surgery. Okay, you are advising radical radiotherapy. Patient is seen by your radiation oncologist, and uh, they are discussing the pros and cons. They are a bit worried with patients uh, LUTS and it's not responded well to tamsulosin. What will you do? So for this patient, um, I need to control his lower urinary tract symptoms before he starts the radiotherapy, <coughs> which usually happen in three months following starting the hormones. The hormonal treatment may help to uh, shrink the size of the prostate and improve his symptoms as well. But if the patient uh, was trying uh, Tamsulucin for a few weeks and there is no significant improvement in his symptoms, uh, then I will discuss the patient the need to have a, a channeling TRP uh, prior to his radiotherapy. So in which way channel TRP is different from normal TRP? Uh, in channeling to RP, we are um, aiming just to create a, a good channel in the prostate uh, uh, rather than uh, removing significant amount or rather than resecting the whole anatomical peripheral zone. Um, because with the, uh, with the use of hormonal treatment, um, this will help to improve the patient's symptoms on the long term. So we are just want to ensure that there is a good cavity in the prosthetic fossa so the patient will not went into retention uh, following the radiotherapy. If this patient wishes to have brachytherapy, how will you plan? So uh, 
this patient, I don't think he is a good candidate for radiotherapy because he is a high risk of prostate cancer. And usually we offer it for the low risk and low volume intermediate risk. Uh, so I don't, he will be the, a good candidate. And usually we offer it for a small size of prostate, less than 50 gram and patient without significant loss. So for all this reason, I will not consider a bracket therapy for this patient. Okay. So you are doing channel TRP and the histology shows um, all our BPH tissue. What does this mean? Uh, this is not unexpected because mainly we are resecting the transition zone while most of the prostate cancer is in the peripheral zone. Uh, so it will not change uh, my plan of management. Okay. After starting androgen deprivation treatment, uh, how many weeks or months you need to wait before going for radiotherapy? Uh, usually it's around three months and then the radiotherapy should happen. And since the patient is uh, having a high risk uh, prostate cancer, uh, so I will continue uh, the hormonal treatment for three years. Okay, what medications you're going to start? I will start with the patient by giving bicalutamide, uh, 50 milligram uh, once daily uh, for uh, 28 days. And after 10 days from starting the bicalutamide, uh, I will arrange for the first LHRH uh, uh, agonist injection. So what is your choice? Um, my, choice, uh, my choice is to give uh, uh, Azuradix 10.8 um, milligram three monthly. Okay. What precautions you need to take when you're doing channel T or P? Um, to be careful uh, not to resect uh, much of tissue uh, close to the sphincter uh, because the sphincter may become weaker with, <coughs> with the radiotherapy and this may increase the chance of uh, incontinence later on. Okay, that time's up now. Good. Nice presentation. Um, I know we have discussed uh, various BPH scenarios before. That's why I try to give you a little bit of a, a different scenario which also involves uh, components of BPH treatment with prostate cancer and you handled it well. Um, just only few advices here and there. Um, you said I will examine the patient for wasting. Uh, wasting means wasting of the muscles. Sorry. If you are examining the patient, you will be saying I will be examining the patient for emaciation, which is like a generalized weakness, generalized loss of weight, etc. Uh, if you are saying wasting, you should uh, substantiated with seeing for wasting of muscles because none of the things we use the word wasting yeah. and uh, I agree with your investigations but if you see the nice kind lines there is a role for CT abdomen and pelvis and bone scan for patients with uh, high risk prostate cancer. I agree if the MRI is nicely reported by a radiologist interested in urology and there is no lymph nodes present in the MRI, the chances of skip lymph nodes in the rest of the abdominal cavity is rare. But as per the guidelines, high risk prostate cancer, CT abdomen and pelvis and bone scans or the staging investigations. I'm happy for you to refer and come back to me. We can discuss this even later. Yeah. Regarding the choice or omission of radical prostatectomy for patient aged 75, um, I don't ask, accept with your view. There are some very good uh, articles on radical prostatectomy in octogenarians and also radical cystectomy in octogenarians. So radical prostatectomy especially is uh, published in our uh, uh, Journal of Clinical Urology and uh, uh, it is a well established surgery and uh, even the, the Journal of Urology also has publications of role of radical prostatectomy in octogenarian. So if the patient is fit, there is definitely a role for radical prostatectomy. I understand your concerns of not giving them the option because of your institution or specific surgeon related choice. That's different. But when you are presenting in the exam, you will be more guided by the guidelines rather than the individual experts uh, opinions. And um, Happy for you to start Tamsulosin. It's a good medicine. Sometimes that may improve the Euroflow and you may not have to do the channeling TURP. The other thing which you can bring in is you are waiting at least three months after starting androgen deprivation treatment. That also can shrink the prostate and improve the urine flow. So you can wait for some time 
rather than rushing to channel T or P. Any surgery avoided is good in preventing unnecessary side effects. Okay. Yeah. Good. One question, if I can ask. Uh, usually, how long after the TRP we should do the radiotherapy? Because I know that we need to leave at least three months following TRP to start radiotherapy. Yeah. Is yeah, it's mainly because um, radiotherapy can cause uh, kind of uh, temporary edema and damage to the sphincter. That's why sometimes patients develop incontinence and then slowly they will develop, they will improve and uh, again pelvic floor exercise is very good. TRP can also cause the same problem of uh, temporary post-TRP incontinence. So we don't want two, three things acting together, creating a temporary symptom into a long term or a bo quite bothersome symptom. So I will say three months is a good thing. Even brachytherapy is possible if the patient is otherwise fit, like as you said, low or intermediate risk prostate cancer and prostate size less than 50 cc. It is very important that we need to wait before the TRP related edema and inflammation is nicely settled down. So the ideal method is start tamsulosin immediately once the patient is symptomatic even before you do any prostate biopsy because prostate biopsy and those kind of clinical um, attendants can cause a patient to tilt towards the urinary retention. So tamsulosin can prevent urinary retention when the patient is having prostate biopsy and other investigations. And uh, once the diagnosis is established, Antigen deprivation treatment will improve the patient's status further. Urophometry will tell you the improvement after tamsulosin and antigen deprivation treatment. If there is not much improvement, if the patient is happy for only radiotherapy, go ahead with uh, channel TRP as soon as possible so that, as you said, maybe three months is a good time to wait before radical radiotherapy. But given the choice to me, I will also keep radical prostatectomy as one of the options that will cure both the op LUTS and posture cancer in one shot. There is no need for transurethral resection prostate surgery. There is no need for tamsulosin for long term and that may sometime give the patient a very good recovery. Yeah, excellent. Thank you very much. <coughs> Can we do one more scenario? Uh, yes, please. Okay. You have a 45 year old gentleman presenting with uh, history of uh, difficulty in passing urine and um, weak stream and nighttime frequency. How are you going to evaluate him? I will see him in the dedicated uh, lots of clinic. Uh, I will take a, a history from the patient about avoiding symptoms, uh, storage urinary uh, symptoms, uh, any associated post-mutrition tripling or dysuria. I will ask also about uh, uh, any incontinence, uh, uh, I will ask about his any red flag uh, symptoms like uh, hematuria, recurrent UTI, um, uh, pain. Um, I will uh, check the patient uh, status of the bowel, um, his sexual function. I will ask about his medical history, uh, any uh, medical comorbidities or the use of uh, any medication or phytotherapy. I will check any previous surgery or radiotherapy. I will check a patient uh, uh, drinking habit, any smoking, and uh, um, and then I will examine the patient in the presence of a uh, chaperone with the patient consent, um, uh, mainly looking uh, for any uh, palpable bladder, I'll examine the genitalia for any phimosis, uh, metal stenosis, um, hypospadias, any palpable nodule in the uh, uh, urethra, and then uh, I will examine the testes and examine uh, uh, the prostate uh, via DRE. I will arrange for the patient to have a urine. I will give the patient the IPSS, uh, uh, push IPSS form to fill in, and also the uh, bladder dairy, three days bladder dairy. I will uh, arrange for urine dip stick. I will arrange for the patient to have a flow rate and the bladder scan while he is in the, um, in the clinic, and then I take it from there. Okay, he has no medical comorbidities, he is uh, quite happy otherwise except for his voiding LUTS. Examination showed fairly flat prostate, maybe 20 to 25 cc, no other physical examination findings significant, IPS is 28 out of 35, quality of life 4 out of 6, he is quite bothered, Eurofluometry showed a maximum flow rate of 11 ml per second, he voided 350 ml with 130 ml residue. Okay. I want to see also the, the pattern of the flow rate. 
which may give me an idea about the cause because in this patient I'm concerned about the possibility of uh, urethral stricture because he is relatively young so I want to see whether the uh, flow uh, pattern is, is box like which is suggestive of stricture. Okay, the flow pattern showed an obstructive pattern. There is a gradual rise and decrease, but the peak is quite low. There is no sign of box pattern or urethral stricture. Okay, so, um, so and there is, there is no history before of any instrumentation or no. any SDI? No instrumentation. Okay, so in this patient, um, I will assume since there is nothing suggestive in the history, um, of uh, possibility of urethral stricture, there is no history of any uh, possible neuropathic bladder, then I would think that this may be an early onset of uh, blood due to prosthetic enlargement. So I would give the patient uh, lifestyle advice. And uh, since his uh, symptoms are um, uh, severe symptom according to the uh, IPSS, I will offer him a tamsulosin therapy. Okay. He is trying tamsulosin. He has some improvement in his urinary symptoms, but he's quite bothered with absence of ejaculation. Why this happens? Um, so lack of ejaculation uh, with tamsulosin due to failure of emission, <coughs> uh, which is uh, one of the known side effects of tamsulosin therapy. Okay, so how are you going to treat him now? So unfortunately, this side effect may happen with other alpha blocker. However, it's uh, occur more frequently with tamsulosin because it is a specific alpha-1A. So uh, if the patient is happy to try another alpha blocker like alpha zosin, which may associate with less incidence of this uh, a problem, we can try that. Uh, if the patient is not happy to consider medical treatment and is still having a significant symptoms, um, uh, I will keep a low threshold to go ahead with uh, flexible cystoscopy to assess the urethra, bladder, neck, uh, and the bladder. Okay, you said the receptor for tamsulosin is alpha-1A, and you want to change to alpha -zosin. In which way alpha -zosin is different? Because alpha is uh, less specific than tamsulosin, so the sexual side effect, mainly lack of uh, emission uh, of the semen, uh, is less with alpha and other alpha blocker, uh, unlike tamsulosin and solidosin. Okay. He is trying alpha zosin and uh, he's not very pleased and he wants something to be done. He's not uh, convinced that he's going to take this alpha zosin for long term being an young 45 year old man. What other options he has? So in this case, um, <coughs> we need to go toward um, surgical treatment. So I want first to um, do a flexible cystoscopy. Uh, to assess his prost uh, to assess the, his urethra, bladder, neck, and the bladder, and also I will do at the same time transrectal ultrasound to assess the prostate size. Okay, his transrectal ultrasound prostate size is 22 cc. Flexible cystoscopy showed a normal urethra. Prostate is not very occlusive as far as the lateral lobes are concerned, but he has high bladder, neck. Bladder has grade one trabaculations just in the process of forming. There are few areas of raised ridges. Bilateral uretic orifice is normal. <coughs> so in this patient, I think uh, the hypertrophied bladder neck is a cause of his symptoms. So he may benefit from bladder neck incision. However, in accordance with the EAU guideline, this patient uh, need to have a urodynamic study before any surgical intervention. So I will arrange for him to have a urodynamic study. Can you explain that uh, EAU guidelines supporting urodynamics in this patient? What other patients you will do urodynamics before intervention? So uh, patients who are aged less than 50 or above uh, 80, uh, patient uh, with, who failed the previous uh, bladder outlet uh, obstruction surgery, uh, patient with significant post void residue more than 300 ml, uh, patient with significant symptoms, uh, and a flow rate more than 15 uh, mL uh, per second, uh, patients who are unable to uh, avoid more than uh, 150 mL uh, in the flow rate, and also patients known to have uh, a, neuro, um, um, a neurological disease. Okay. Urodynamics showed a filling phase is normal. There is good sensation and maximum sensation at the correct period. There is no signs of any detrusor instability. 
Voiding face showed high detrusor pressures and he is a high pressure voider. He showed increased bladder outlet obstruction and bladder contactility index. So how are you going to plan? So there is a, a high bladder outlet obstruction index in yes. this patient. Yes. Uh, so this patient is uh, obstructive by urodynamic uh, terms. So I expect that the patient will uh, have a benefit in 90% of the cases uh, following uh, relief of his bladder outlet obstruction. So um, in take into consideration the age of the patient and the size of the of the, of the size of the prostate and the anatomical appearance of his prosthetic urethra. Um, I will offer him uh, a bladder neck uh, incision, which will give him a good symptomatic relief uh, with a low side effect profile. So how will you do bladder neck incision? What is the reason behind his pathology? Uh, the reason why he had only median loop enlargement. Or, yeah. Why is uh, that? Because uh, the growth of the prostate in and uh, Benign prosthetic hyperplasia, the growth of a prostate may not be universal. Uh, so sometimes the growth mainly may affect the lateral loops or may affect the median loop, or sometimes it is just a trilobar uh, enlargement. Okay, so how will you do bladder neck incision? So bladder neck incision, uh, I will inform him that uh, this is a day case procedure and the general spinal anesthesia, I will explain to the patient uh, the risk benefit and the alternative and support my consent with the bounce leaflet so in a properly anesthetized uh, prepared patient who uh, checklist of lactic antibiotic and then i will go with the resector scope check the prosthetic urethra the bladder landmark and then i will do two incision um, uh, with the collins knife for, from at five and seven o'clock uh, from the bladder neck uh, down to the viromontana Okay, is there any other options available for him other than bladder neck incision? Uh, the patient is not keen to consider a bladder neck incision, which is recommended uh, by NICE guideline for prostate less than 30. And then uh, uh, I will consider, I will discuss with the patient uh, uh, other options. Uh, I, I guess this patient is relatively young, so he may be uh, interested in uh, preserving his ejaculation. So I will offer him some of the minimally invasive procedure to preserve the ejaculation, uh, like eye tint or uh, urolift uh, or uh, resume. I am aware that most of these procedures approved by NAS guideline for a prostate between 30 to 80, uh, but I think this patient uh, will be a candidate for this as well. Um, if the patient uh, ejaculation is not a priority, then I can offer him a TRP. Okay, we'll stop there. Um, again, a nice starting stage investigations, preparing everything is fine, except for uh, terminology like uh, palpation of nodule in the urethra. I understand you are having the urethral structure in your mind, but instead mm. of stating it as a nodule, you can state it as like a scar in the urethra or any irregularity in the corpus spongiosum. Uh, nodule is not a very correct demonstration of a stricture of urethra it will be more of scarring rather than actual nodule but it's only a change of terminology nothing wrong in that uh, yeah. nodule is more for like a prostatic nodule suspicious nodule in the prostate like that more of a malignant thing while scar is more of a benign thing yeah um, i'm not very convinced with you doing a truss ultrasound measurement not very commonly performed but I understand sometimes if you want to do any minimally invasive surgery, it's better to have a formal transrectal ultrasound. I, I agree with you, but uh, just be careful when you are presenting that because I don't think it's very commonly used unless for any proper study or etc. Just yeah. in the end, when I am discussing the other options you brought in correctly, I tend resume Eurolift, but you also mentioned TURP. TURP has no role in a patient with just bladder neck obstruction alone, high bladder neck alone. High bladder neck and median lobe are entirely different. So median lobe is just a trilobar enlargement of the prostate while bilobar lateral lobes will cause the kissing lobe causing the obstruction which is not present in our patient and the median lobe is something which is growing above the bladder neck into the bladder as one of the nodule because there is a good space available for the extra nodule to grow. Otherwise, 
median lobe is just a prostate while high bladder neck is anatomically not a prostate it is just hypertrophy of the bladder neck due to increased adrenergic action the bladder neck is hypertrophied and uh, that's why you are just incising the bladder neck and when you are incising if there is a good amount of tissue between your two incisions you can use a uh, TRP loop to remove the tissue to create a nice incision it is not equivalent to a median lobe resection so median lobe is different pathophysiologically compared to high bladder neck and so when when you are bringing in euro lift just be careful nice guideline says it is uh, only for patients between 50 to 80 years the may 2021 latest nice guidelines previously uh, it is accepted up to 100 cc but now the latest one says 30 to uh, 50 to 80 50, age of 50 mainly size is okay size is quite as you said 30 to 80 is a good this patient i mentioned as 45 years you can do but patients should be aware that uh, the nice guidelines advises you to lift only after 50 years i thought of taking you to the next question um, how will you do euro lift in a patient with high blood and neck you can discuss the 4d technology where uh, technique where you can keep four euro lift clips in the four corners there are some surgeons who do blood and neck incision also at the same time but once there is blood and neck incision it can cause retrograde ejaculation if the patient is quite feels important to maintain anti-grade ejaculation it's better to do only the 4D <coughs> technique blood and neck incision will jeopardize his anti-grade ejaculation you have correctly mentioned tamsulosin causing absence of emission also try to mention the word an ejaculation uh, try to use the correct terminologies so an ejaculation for tamsulosin while blood and neck incision will cause retrograde ejaculation okay any other things you want to add before we conclude? Uh, no, thank you very much. It was very nice, very helpful session. <coughs> thank you. Yeah, purposefully I picked up the situations which we haven't discussed before because we discussed BPH at least two to three times for your batch itself with various other trainees. So I just want to touch a little bit uh, rare scenarios, but at the same time not losing the predominant uh, main pathway, etc. I hope it was useful very useful I, and I, I, I'm uh, hoping that we have more of this uh, unusual twist and scenario yeah. um, rather than repeating the, the previous one yeah. which covered everything before yeah thank you very much good very good have a nice weekend I will send you another date for early next week um, in a day or two and then we'll take it from there thank you very much okay. have a nice weekend. thank you bye bye, bye. thank you